Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to today's Thought Leader Roundtable, a conversation on readiness. Today's conversation is part of a regular series of explorations of the key questions of what does it mean for all young people to be ready for life's demands at every stage, and what is it going to take to get us there? Karen Pittman, CEO of the Forum for Youth Investment, leads lively and candid conversations with some of the most influential boundary-pushing leaders working to improve the lives of children and young people in the U.S. Today's session will feature Nancy Deutsch with Youth Next, the University of Virginia Center to Promote Effective Youth Development at the Curry School of Education. The conversation will focus on the connection of SEL and after school. A little bit about our presenters. Karen Pittman is president and CEO of the Forum for Youth Investment and a respected sociologist and leader in youth development. Prior to co-founding the Forum in 1998, she launched adolescent pregnancy prevention initiatives at the Children's Defense Fund, started the Center for Youth Development and Policy Research, and served as Senior Vice President at the International Youth Foundation. Nancy Deutsch is the Director of YouthNext. She is a Professor of Research, Statistics, and Evaluation and Applied Developmental Science and is also affiliated with the Curry School's Youth and Social Innovation Program. Deutsch's research examines the socio-ecological context for adolescent development, particularly issues related to identity. She is focused on the role of after-school programs and relationships with important adults. Nancy is especially interested in the process of adolescent learning and development as it unfolds within local environments to better understand how to create settings that better support youth, especially those at risk due to economic or socio-cultural factors. There are only a handful of slides for today's session. We will be accepting questions and comments via the chat feature on, on the webinar service, which is available at the top of your screen. Today's session is being recorded uh, early next week, we will send it to everyone who registered and also post it to the Ready by 21 website along with any additional resources that get mentioned during the session. So, my pleasure to turn it over to Karen. Thanks, Ian. Um, and welcome, Nancy. Uh, I'm glad to have you on the phone. Sorry we're not together in person. Um, and I'm hoping the weather is good down there where you are in Charlottesville. Um, <laughs> and uh, let me just get us started quickly because I know folks are excited. Um, I'm hoping folks have gone to the link um, and not only uh, looked at your paper that was in uh, the Future of Children uh, edition focused on social and emotional learning, uh, but scanned some of the others. Um, and if they haven't, they probably will won't do by the end of this conversation. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation because, um, as some of you may know, um, I've spent the last year and a half as a part of the National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development um, that's housed inside the Aspen Institute. Um, and that commission has been focused on uh, what it takes to really get the educational ecosystem with K-12 at the center um, more connected around the idea of integrating social and emotional and cognitive learning into academics and into academic instruction. Um, I've had the pleasure of uh, uh, chairing a youth development working group um, to make sure that the youth development partners in that ecosystem uh, that surround schools um, have uh, a voice and uh, we can increase the understanding of the role that after school programs uh, can play and the role that youth development professionals can play uh, in schools and after school um, in supporting social and emotional uh, learning. And I can say candidly over the year and a half, uh, sometimes explaining the role and the value of after school programs is harder than you would think. So I'm delighted to have uh, a chance to talk to Nancy, um, who has both thought about um, and pulled together the research on why after school programs are well suited um, to play this role in young people's lives, and then also thought equally uh, uh, importantly about what we can do to really have more of a research presence uh, and why we don't. So we're going to sort of have this conversation in two parts. Um, first, really sort of talking about that, why after school is in this space, uh, and Nancy has uh, in the first part of her paper has really affirmed several things that we have been saying um, that youth development organizations and partners have been saying as a part of the commission. The first is that after school programs are really well suited for promoting social and emotional learning. Uh, the second is that after school uh, staff may actually have more time and opportunities to get young people engaged in social and emotional learning activities and in important conversations because of the informal nature um, of the program. 
The third idea is that after-school programs and youth development organizations um, may have more informal conversations um, and connections with families. Uh, and one of the things that we'd often know with schools is that they want to connect to family, and we talk about connecting to family and community. And then the last point that we're really emphasizing is that after-school organizations, youth development organizations, can partner with schools and other organizations more effectively to increase opportunities for social and emotional learning, um, both in the after-school hours and uh, during the school day. And Nancy has spoken to all of those points um, in the paper, so having sort of teed those up, I'm going to go back through them one at a time and uh, get, get Nancy a chance to really talk about uh, what we know about after-school programs. Um, so, Nancy, just going back to the first one, you start off by really saying that after-school programs have always focused on social-emotional learning um, and promoting adult practices. Uh, tell us more about that. When you sort of look at this historically, why has this always been uh, an important part of after-school programs or youth development programs more broadly? Yeah, um, great. Thanks, Karen. And and first, I just want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this. I'm I'm really excited to be talking to you today and and talking to everyone who's joining us today. Um, I think this is an incredibly important um, conversation to be having. And as you said, um, unfortunately, all too frequently, after school is sort of seen as secondary or left out of the conversation. So I think it's really important to emphasize the role, um, which, which links to that first that first sort of topic that you teed up because, you know, it's interesting to me that after school programs has have tended to have less influence or impact on the SEL field because in fact that's really in some ways a core of what they do, right? So after school programs tend to have much more holistic missions in terms of youth development, right? Whereas we think of schools um, certainly as being primarily focused around the academic development of kids. After school programs missions, I mean, if you look at the mission statements of organizations, um, some might be very specifically targeted, right? If you have an arts organization or um, it may be targeted on a particular domain, um, but certainly comprehensive centers and um, tend to be focused and youth development organizations tend to have missions and goals that are about um, supporting youth, right? And supporting youth um, to enable young people to reach their full potential, right? And and things that are very, very holistic in nature, and that by by definition includes social emotional um, learning. Um, they also don't have, you know, curriculums or standardized testing pressures, right? So there's there isn't any um, academic benchmark that most programs need to meet, although I think that has been changing and sort of in the 1960s was actually, I think we think of it as being even more so now, but the first turn towards academics really came in the 1960s when programs um, started to try to access federal funding that was for supporting students in communities where the schools were more under-resourced. And so some programs turned towards looking more, focusing more on academics um, but the founding features of youth development programs were often about um, socializing um, young people and, and initially came out of concerns about young people who were um, on the streets during um, times when parents were at work. If you think about sort of the turn of the century and, and the rise of, of um, formalized schooling and coinciding with immigration and um, this concern of reformers and youth advocates for ensuring that um, young people, and, and oftentimes particularly immigrant young people in, in, in cities, um, were sort of receiving positive socialization during hours when neither parents nor, nor adults at school were, were around. Um, but I think today, you know, in addition to the, the sort of positive youth development framework that most organizations use today, right, the idea of taking a strengths-based approach again, I think helps focus on the sort of holistic and social emotional aspects of young people. Um, another aspect that we don't always think about is the importance of um, the fact that having shared cultural norms and voluntary participation in after school as actually potentially supporting peer cultures um, that with structured adult support can encourage positive social emotional learning. So the kinds of opportunities that young people have, both with peers and adults, um, can be promotive of social emotional learning. Um, so I think that that's all, you know, I think this sort of, 
the combination of the opportunities that are provided and, and the real mission and goal of programs makes them natural settings um, for, for the development of SEL skills and competencies. Yeah, you've said a lot of really important uh, things there, Nancy. So I want to come back and just sort of emphasize a couple of them because mm -hmm. they really are important. One is a phrase that I know is used a lot in Great Britain and other Commonwealth countries, but I don't hear it as often here. And, and you use the phrase positive socialization. Um, mm -hmm. And that the important role, for all the reasons you just said, that that parents are looking for opportunities, whether those are in their faith organizations, they're in, in youth development organizations, they're looking for opportunities to make sure their young people are being socialized. They are learning to be social beings and practicing that um, and finding positive peer groups. Um, all of those are very important things that sometimes I fear when we go to the shorthand social emotional learning, we don't bring in the broader context of the kinds of experiences young people need to have, formal, quasi-formal, informal, which really contribute to their overall socialization, which is very much a part of development. So that, that term, positive social, social, socialization, is important. You also emphasize the voluntary nature um, of these programs that young people and their families um, uh, in an ideal world really get to sort of select um, the, the places where they want to spend their time that fit them best, or at least inside of those programs, have more opportunities to select activities um, that fit their interests and needs best. And so that voluntary nature coupled with um, the lower accountability, no one's grading you for being in the after school program um, or, or helping or pacing the content in a way um, that's required, um, those are important things. Could you talk a little bit, um, because I think it's such an important word, do you see a tension between the mission, the historic mission of positive socialization and what has become, um, especially in the elementary school grades, um, an emphasis on after school from a safety perspective? Um, so we've got socialization in that broad sense of why we want young people to be in these programs. And then oftentimes a lot of the funding came because, as you said, we're looking to make sure young people have safe places to go. This is where they go when they leave school before their parents can pick them up. And whether we're talking about uh, protecting young people uh, from uh, you know, unstructured settings or we're talking about for uh, older teens' safety so that they're not getting into trouble, how do you see the safety and the socialization themes fitting together? Um, that's a great question, Karen. And, you know, certainly I have spent time, you know, I, I've seen programs where that um, the balance has been so tilted, I would say, too far towards safety, right, where the program was so focused on keeping it highly structured to ensure safety that there wasn't really a lot of positive socialization opportunity for the young people, right? That the staff were very much focused on sort of just um, keeping control and, and, and you got that both from the physical and the psychological sort of environment there. And I, I you know, my gut was that did not feel, right? Like a place where young people were gonna have an opportunity to really develop social, social emotionally. So I think the balance is really important you know, I think when we go back to those early um, early uh, uh, features of positive developmental settings that the National Research Council put together, you know, one of them is uh, safety, but it's physical and psychological safety, right? And, and I think that second point, psychological safety, is, is really important. I think sometimes we, when we think about safety, we think of only the physical safety aspect, and particularly today where, you know, there are in many communities, um, you know, there are high rates of violence that make the physical safety feel um, particularly important and salient, and, and it certainly is. But you you want to also think about psychological safety, right, and and opportunity for growth. And I think there are a lot of things that adults in youth programs do to promote both physical and psychological safety without it having to feel like um, you know a heavy 
disciplinary right um, place because I think that that is we know that for many kids um, school does not feel like a psychologically safe space whether or not it feels like a physically safe space right and they and for many youth they don't feel a sense of belonging in school and that that is in part due to things like the discipline gap in our in our um, school system right where we know that young people from racially minoritized backgrounds tend to get disciplined at different rates. And so after school programs can offer a, a relief from that, right? And a sense of psychological safety for young people who may not feel that psychological safety in school. Um, so I can think about things that adult staff do, like being there to intervene in peer groups in the moment, right? And actually being able to see informal peer interactions and both scaffold them and model positive interaction um, and promote positive peer socialization and culture by being present as kind of near peer role models and by providing scaffolding in the moment in a way that many of the other adults don't have access to, right? Teachers spend kids with time, at least when you get to the upper levels, there's not a lot of um, unstructured time that teachers spend with students. So they don't necessarily have that opportunity for natural role modeling or mentoring um, in terms of human relationships. And parents, um, particularly as kids get older, right, have less in the moment seeing kids in social groups. And so in some ways, after school program staff are some of the, the few adults that have the opportunity to, to, this is gonna sound odd as I say it, but interact with kids in some ways in their own natural environment and peer group, right? Um, which I think can promote safety in an odd way. I don't know if yeah, that went, again, went where you were thinking of it going, but. Yeah. That, no, again, a huge number of, of, of valuable points and, and, and bringing this to a word that again, uh, uh, is coming back to be used and that, and that word is belonging. Um, mm -hmm. And so what I hear you talking about really is, you know, one approach to safety is sort of a lockdown approach to really make sure young people are safe because the, the space is safe, the relationships are carefully controlled, and the other is to really get to emotional safety um, mm -hmm. and get to young people having um, increased capacity for empathy because you're creating structures in which you're really emphasizing belonging. Um, and whether we're talking about uh, uh, after school or youth development programs that really do have, uh, they have uh, not only a brand, but, uh, but you know, a, a personalized brand. I'm a Boy Scout, I'm a Girl Scout, I'm a member of the Boys and Girls Clubs, I'm a campfire kid. Um, that, that, that sense of uh, there is a, you know, there's a positive peer group that I'm a part of and a positive culture that I'm a part of. So I think those are really very important points. Um, and that opportunity to really, I mean, really good point of just, you know, you want to be able to see young people in social settings doing social interactions. That's often hard to do, to see in a family for obvious reasons. Um, either you don't have enough kids or they're very different ages. Um, and then when you have them in those interactions in school, especially when we, when we focus on the classroom, um, we don't see them. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about in the commission and one of the places where youth development organizations are starting to come into school is to emphasize the importance of taking advantage of the fact that there are spaces inside of school during the school day where young people, where social grouping happens and nobody's paying attention. Whether that's the playground, it's the cafeteria, um, it's you know kids hanging out in the hallway, and, and youth development professionals are, are coming in to both help uh, 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 the other adults in the building play roles in those spaces um, or coming in to actually play roles in those spaces. So the conversation of sort of shifting to really think about how we take advantage of all of the kind of places where young people gather, group, learn, uh, connect, um, is getting into the building in different ways that I think reinforces um, the point that you that you just made. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this sort of after school programs have more time and more opportunities to get young people engaged um, mm -hmm. in social emotional learning, but also engaged in content areas that interest them. And and one of the things that I think happens um, sometimes when we sort of use the after school language and we couple it with talking about social 
emotional and academic learning or integrating social, emotional, and academic is that we think academic is the content and social and emotional are the, the skills that you need to be able to engage with the content. But mm-hmm. after school programs also provide, as you mentioned, a variety of opportunities for young people to engage in content or skill building in areas that may be of more interest to them or may feel more relevant to them. So you mentioned arts programs and others. Can you talk a little bit about the, even if it's a sort of a multi-purpose after school program, the role that after school programs play in helping young people not just have a chance to uh, practice and reinforce social emotional skills, but also build the cognitive skills, problem solving, initiative, et cetera, that are associated with mastering some content that you like. Yeah, absolutely. So first, I, I'm going to actually start with a, a comment about something that um, is that, that sort of I think is also pushing. Uh, as you noted, on what we think of as content, right? So, you know, SEL can be content in and of itself, right? So when we talk later about the research findings, one of the the studies that is most frequently cited in this area is um, Durlock and and Weisberg's meta-analysis, right? Which is a a sort of study of a bunch of studies, right? Where they they sort of looked across a whole bunch of studies. Um, And, you know, what they found was that programs, um, not after school programs could not only impact SEL, but that programs that focused on SEL could actually impact academic outcomes without focusing on academics. But I think what's, what's really important about that is that it wasn't all programs, right? It was programs that had these specific features. And one of those features, I'll talk more about the other features later when we talk about this, but one of the features is actually um, a focused SEL component with explicit learning learning objectives, right, which suggests that SEL in and of itself can be a content area addressed by programs, right? right? But then I think what what we were sort of talking about was more about the idea of alternative content um, to academics many of which are being pushed out of school, right? So as, as standardized, the, the pressures on standardized testing increase in schools, there is less time being spent on art and music and theater, right? And other kinds of um, opportunities or, or non-academic interests. Um, and we also know that that is differential across schools, right? With, with, with more and less resources and that the number of school-based activities um, is different across schools. So after school programs can really serve as a place that can kind of fill in these, these interest areas. And that's really important for young people, right? If you think about particularly in adolescence, but also in younger childhood, as you're figuring out what your interests are and what your skills are, um, th- arts, music, sports, recreation, whatever the content is, it gives you an opportunity to sort of find what you enjoy and want to try doing and learn. Um, and, and you know, it's interesting, there was actually a, a, a column in, in this past week's New York Times about, ho- Times about hobbies and the importance of just, of just having things that we enjoy doing, that, that mastery is great, but we don't actually have to be focused on mastering everything, right? That we can do things for the enjoyment of them. And I think young people trying out different things helps them learn about themselves and it gives them a chance to develop different skills. So, you know, there's great research. Um, Reed Larson and some of his colleagues studied these youth theater programs and looked at how the process of putting on a play in a theater program um, was linked to emotional development, right? It was teaching them how to do things like self-regulate and, um, you know, collaborate with peers. And so, so I think that there are both opportunities for kind of self-development, but then also for the development of specific skills, SEL skills, um, that are tapped into by different activities. Um, And youth are also, you know, can be very highly engaged in interest-driven activities, right? Which then we know things from, so for example, like flow theory about how, you know, what happens when you're highly engaged and motivated and that that intrinsic motivation. And so I think those opportunities um, allow youth that space and freedom to, to both explore and skill build. 
Right. Absolutely. And I think that, the, you know, the, the, the word that we're looking for um, uh, or the thing that we're looking to increase is engagement. I mean, that's, yep. it, it, if, if young people aren't engaged, they aren't learning anything. Um, and read, read mm-hmm. data, read Larson's data has also shown that as well. Um, they can be sitting in the seat, but if they're not engaged either cognitively or they're not engaged emotionally, um, they're just sitting in a seat. Um, that learning and skill building isn't happening or the content infusion isn't happening. Um, so I think that's important. And as you said, we're getting better with the language about um, making sure that we're really creating the context uh, for learning uh, that are supportive, uh, making sure that um, we're actually delivering whatever the content it is that we're delivering in ways, as you just described, that allow young people to use and practice their skills. And then having explicit instruction about the skills, all three of those things are important, um, and I think our general understanding of the importance of scaffolding those um, is increasing and our, our consistent language about that. So I, I yeah. appreciate that. Um, you know, I also, oh, sorry, I just wanted to add one no, thing that I didn't mention in that that I think is also important um, twofold. One is that, you know, there's a great place for sort of um, specific targeted programs, right? So, you know, the theater program or, or, or you know, the, the coding program. Um, but um, comprehensive centers, I think, are also really important in that they give kids a tr- chance to try out multiple things under one roof with one set of relationships, right? Um, so that, I think, is also is, is really important to that, to that end of figuring out what engages you. Um, and then I also wanted to note that one thing that I think is somewhat unique about after-school programs that provides important SBL opportunities, not, it's not so much about the content, but I would say about the context is that many programs are more multi-age than other settings, right? And young people, or young, younger peers and older peers working together um, provide really important SEL development opportunities for both the younger and older kids, right? When older kids begin to learn how to serve as role models and mentors to younger students, that is, you know, building their empathy there, you know, and, and, and other sort of self-awareness and social awareness skills. And then young people see the older youth, you know, enacting in those ways, and that helps them too. So that that cross-age component, I think, is an under-considered strength of after school for SEL. Yeah. Also another incredibly invaluable point. Um, we're hitting the halfway point in the conversation. Uh, we knew the time was going to go quickly. Just want to remind people to submit your questions uh, via the chat. Also use the Twitter hashtag, uh, hashtag ready youth. Anything capitalized in that, Ian? No. No? Uh-huh. Or, or hashtag ready youth. Um, there's a good conversation going. Ian, while we pause, any questions you want to insert into the discussion for Nancy? Uh, there are a few questions that have come in. The first one is just uh, someone requesting a list of the citations that have been mentioned so far. We can definitely provide that. Um, And the other question, I'm at an organization that has as its pillars four pillars of after-school work relationships, academics, and enrichment. Our goals are improving academic performance and strengthening social and emotional mindsets and skills of our students. We're struggling with how to how much to program SEL time and how to embed or integrate SEL into all that we do. Where would you start, especially with staff who are part-time and often struggle themselves with mastering foundational SEL skills and mindsets? What are your ideas or tips on how to start? Okay. So let me do a quick commercial on the first one, and then Ian will make sure that it's, it's posted uh, as well. And then we'll take the second question about how do we, how do we actually make sure uh, the staff and after school programs are ready and prepared to do this integration of social emotional learning um, with the academic and with the other content that they're providing as we go into uh, a second conversation about both the research um, uh, and where we are in terms of having enough research behind this as well as perhaps technical assistance and improvement strategies and then also talk a little bit about the, the barriers um, uh, that currently exists, which I know you emphasized in, uh, in your paper, Nancy. Um, the, the, uh, again, uh, the, the, Nancy's written many things, and so I'm going to let her talk about all the things that she's written, but we're specifically uh, sort of riffing off of 
uh, uh, chapter in uh, The Future of Children uh, uh, volume, uh, Spring 2017, um, that was uh, uh, completely devoted to social emotional learning um, and funded by the Wallace Foundation, who's also generously funded this conversation for us today. Uh, and uh, that's the www.futureofchildren.org. We'll get there and also you know, put up the site to go to the Wallace, Wallace Foundation's Knowledge Center where you'll find this and, and many other great things that answer some of your questions. Um, going to the second question of, you know, what does it take to really get staff to be able to do uh, this integrated uh, approach um, to social, emotional, I'm going to go ahead and add in as the, the research uh, 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 committee uh, working with the Seed Commission has now sort of gotten us to emphasize social, emotional, and cognitive, um, as well, and then the content, which happens to be academic. But the, the, the social really connects to, you know, as you said, those things that really sort of keep young people in the room, uh, the things that help them have a sense of safety and belonging, um, uh, that's self-regulation, et cetera, that sort of middle space of things that really allow you to uh, participate. Uh, teamwork, responsibility, time management is that set of skills. And then that top set of skills often thought of as you know, the higher order thinking skills or the cognitive skills, the problem solving, the initiative, things like that. Um, all of those scaffold and it's important for staff to understand all of them um, and to understand how to integrate them, uh, integrate them all in. Um, so Nancy, so one one question just to let you respond directly to that. Um, the challenge is of really doing that integration are um, maybe the opportunities may be more in after school programs because they're less less driven by delivering uh, certain content against timelines, but we still have challenges of making sure that we're really getting that done. Um, so what what advice, and I'll offer advice as well, but what advice do you offer for programs that are really trying to be more intentional about this integration of social and emotional learning into academic, into their content areas. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I noticed, that I think that sort of links to another question that I'd seen posted um, about sort of the challenge of finding high quality staff, um, given that positions are often part-time and low paid and what, what we're sort of asking for her takes a fair amount of skill, right? Um, so I, I think that across of this, you know, the idea of professionalizing staff is something that is talked about all the time. And, and I think it's really, really important to think about, right? Like the fact that we, we sort of, um, if you look at what's been happening in the early childhood realm, I think that the after school realm, I, I feel like we are primed to be that next um, domain, right? Where there is attention paid to thinking about, um, professional development and training um, and professionalization of the workforce in after school. Um, you know, per, not assuming, I think that, that not assuming that you can just sort of take an adult and, you know, put them in an after school program because it seems like they might work well with kids and they're going to be able to do this, but that it really does take specific training um, and that there are particular things that um, staff can be trained on. And, and yes, some of them are things like empathy and communication and attunement that may feel more or less like qualities, but then thinking about the qualities that you want to hire. But then there's also need for, you know, that there's the SEL challenge that highlighted strategies for supporting staff in promoting SEL. Um, and they included a lot of information about training that you really need to train staff on specific practices um, and that you have to provide staff with collaborative planning time and time for debriefing and reflection and provide organizational support um, to staff to do this work. Um, so I think that's really important to think about. Um, Karen, what were you going to add? Because I just lost whatever the thought yeah. was. I know you said you were going to add yeah, something. I was going to, you just, you just uh, referenced it. I was going to add the, the, the SEL challenge. So the, the Weikert Center, which is a part of the Forms Youth Investment, um, worked with Susan Crown Exchange uh, and eight really high quality uh, youth development organizations um, serving for the most part disadvantaged uh, teenagers um, with very different content areas from boat building to pregnancy prevention to you know youth organizing and uh, youth advocacy 
Uh, so very different focuses, but high quality organizations um, and really sort of worked with uh, uh, those staff in those organizations to essentially talk about what those skills are um, and begin to name the skills that they thought they really were focusing on and they saw growth in over the arc of their programming with young people. And then also, as you mentioned, Nance, they did talk specifically about the practices. How, what is it exactly that they do to make sure that young people are not just having a general environment in which they can use these skills, but they're actually, they're, they're organizing the, the programming um, and they're making sure staff are using intentional practices. So both creating the space for young people to really, uh, uh, experience uh, these skills and, and name them uh, and see them modeled, um, but also making sure staff are really trained to help them uh, develop those skills. And that's that's yeah. all in, and we'll add this on, it's all uh, a part of uh, what's called preparing youth to thrive. Um, yeah. Lots of tools and resources, uh, both a research study and uh, showing that, that these, these programs really are getting significant improvement um, in social emotional uh, skills across those domain areas. Um, but also, as you said, really talking about the explicit practices that are associated with creating the experiences that get you uh, the skill growth. And as you mm -hmm. mentioned, Nancy, getting down to that granular level of helping people know what are the experiences, what are the practices that help you create experiences for young people consistently so that you can see the skill growth. And sometimes, as you mentioned, those practices are really proactive practices to let young people have space to intervene when things are going on, as well as to sort of plan ahead um, for when you're going to have young people in um, an activity that emphasizes a particular skill. All that yeah, stuff I is agree. Happen. Yeah, and we'll make sure that you've got a lot of those resources um, as Ian is putting up the, the resource list. Uh, we'll link and you to the preparing to thrive work. I think the other, um, so Reed Larson, who I mentioned before, has also done work um, looking in depth at the practices of um, expert staff and programs, and so he's also identified, yes. again, specific practices, not that, not necessarily, he wasn't focused specifically on SEL, but in general, what effective staff and programs do, um, things like how do they deal with dilemmas that arise in the moment, and, um, and right. he's identified some good key core. Um, the other thing I would highlight is, you know, also the importance of staff being culturally responsive, and um, there's a recent paper by Sandy Simpkins and colleagues that talked about sort of um, thinking about the features of positive settings, but then adding a culturally responsive lens to that to really think about what does that mean um, for youth from different cultural backgrounds and how do you ensure that staff are attuned to that in your program, which I think is also really important to pr for promotion of SEL, right, and for creating a um, psychologically safe environment. And then the last thing I would say about thinking about training staff is, you know, there are now an increasing number of in-school curriculum that are content focused but SEL based or that, that focus simultaneously on SEL content and academic content. So um, I have a colleague, Sarah Rim Kaufman, who's been doing some work on the integration of SEL into science and math classrooms. Um, and also the prior work on responsive classroom, right, which is a, a sort of general classroom climate. And I think that, you know, too often in school and out of school time, folks sort of uh, maintain separate, but each, I think, can learn from the other. And even though it may not be about specific academic content, looking at the ways in which some programs are infusing SEL into academic content. Can I think let after school programs think about how to infuse it in non-academic content also and use some of those same kind of techniques or tools? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I think, uh, again, sort of we'll send folks to the, the Wallace Foundation's Knowledge Center. Uh, you'll see several papers there from, from Stephanie Jones, who's been looking at both the, uh, who's at Harvard, um, who's been looking at both the, uh, the, the SEL curricula that have been developed for school, look at those developed specifically for after school, but also been in a very important way um, in trying to acknowledge one of the challenges of bringing in sort of full-blown curricula, which is often um, to, they're not implemented with full fidelity. Uh, and so the idea that there are kernels, that there are practices um, that you can see showing up in multiple curricula, 
um, that have a certain amount of, they have an evidence base behind them, they have a robustness behind them, they're teachable to staff, um, but you can, they can bring them into what they're currently doing as opposed to uh, saying, okay, I'm now going to use this full curriculum. So we've got a lot of those kind of ideas, and we'll make sure that those things are, uh, are uh, sort of up on the, on the website uh, to connect to. Um, as we're sort of passing the halfway point and moving towards <laughs> the end of the discussion, um, I, I want you to talk a little bit because I don't want to. I don't want to shy away from it. You've mentioned some of the things, but there's so much potential for um, after-school and youth development programs to play uh, not only to play a more prominent role in young people's lives, um, but to also play a more strategic role as you just mentioned, in sort of partnering with schools and with other sort of publicly funded institutions, recreation departments, whatever, where they've got, um, you know, they've, they've got a responsibility for having the kids um, mm -hmm. during the day, or they've got settings in which they can be offering more programming. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the barriers to basically scaling after-school programs. If we if people get off of this phone call and are excited and say we should have after school programs for all the kids in our communities, what are the barriers to be able to, able to get to quality after school programs that are doing good SEL at scale? Yeah, great question. So I think that, you know, obviously there are barriers around funding for it, right? Um, that we have not, as a country, made funding the out of school space a priority. Right. Despite the fact that I think, you know, I, I think of out of school and after school as a social justice issue in terms of evening the playing field. when we know that um, that that schools are not equally um, equally funded and equally resourced, that out of school actually have has an opportunity to um, to help provide opportunities in communities where schools may be under-resourced, right? So, um, so certainly, certainly the funding issue. I think somebody mentioned, I noticed someone just, po just popped up. Um, staff, absolutely, right? I think staff hiring, finding quality staff. Again, we're talking about part-time work that's often um, not well paid. And so that limits the, the population, right, of, of potential, potential youth workers. Um, and I think figuring out ways in, in whatever community you're working in to professionalize the staff more so that you can have a larger pool of really high quality staff people to draw from. Um, I think there are creative ways, Karen, some of the things that you were mentioning about bringing in, bringing after school programs into school is a great way to start thinking about that, right? If you can increase the hours and make after school a more full-time job where maybe they're going into the school day partially for some hours during the school day. You're also creating links between school and after school, which we also know is positive for kids' development, right, when they're a tighter connection. Um, yeah. I think in a lot of communities, transportation is a big barrier. Um, when they're not school-based programs, you've got to figure out how you're getting kids, right? Um, and so ha having finding ways to um, to collaborate, for example, between school districts and out-of-school time programs so that maybe school buses can help get kids to programs after school. Um, you know, I think that there's increasingly a lot of the work, Karen, that the forum and others have done in helping communities build networks um, of systems of youth-serving agencies and after-school providers, I think is, is a potential way to start overcoming some of those barriers. Um, and so places like you know, Newport News, Virginia, and Boston's After School and Beyond, and I know the work that you've been doing in, in Richmond and in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and I think those are, uh, you know, there are communities where this is really, that are working together to try to address some of those barriers. Um, That's great. Um, so I will, I, we're, we're at 15 minutes up. We've got some questions. Um, I want to, flag and sort of put a pin in many of the comments that you just made about what we can do to really increase um, sort of opportunities uh, for making sure that more young people have access, some through partnerships, some through scaling, all, some through intermediaries, all the things you mentioned. Um, the the uh, report from the Youth Development Working Group um, that 
the National uh, uh, Commission on Social and Emotional Academic Development um, is producing um, uh, that we helped write. Uh, Priscilla Whittle and I um, and folks from the forum helped uh, a group of about 20 plus uh, youth development organizations to sort of put this report together. We'll come back and provide an opportunity um, to to really talk about some of the recommendations in that report, which speaks to many of the things um, that you said. Um, so we'll set up a separate time to do that. Um, a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one is, and I think you can do this in general, Nancy, and, and specifically for after school, which has had a push on this. One is the connection between SEL and STEM success. Um, just quickly, that, that sort of connection between SEL and STEM, and then um, any comments you want to make about um, efforts that have happened, certainly, to get STEM really pushed into after school um, as a way to, to engage young people in, uh, in academic content in a more interactive way. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that there, there are, so I think as I mentioned, I have a colleague who's actually studying, um, has done some development of and, and, and is also studying um, programs that are explicitly trying to um, integrate STEM and SEL. Um, I don't know that, that research as, as well, but I think there is some work on that and I think it's being looked at. And certainly if you think about the kinds of um, thinking, right, that, that good STEM work requires, I, I, you know, you can, you can sort of see how that links certainly to SEL. Right. Um, and then I think STEM, you know, in after school, I would refer fo folks um, Gil Nome and the group at PEAR has done a lot about how to integrate STEM effectively into, into after school programs. Um, and I think that that work um, is, has, been, has been pushing that yeah. a lot. Yeah. I think another question just came out about the connection between SEL and CTE competency, uh, 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 career and technical education. And, and all of these are coming back to the place where, um, if we come at this from the, if we come at this from the employment perspective, from the employer's perspective, and you mm -hmm. mentioned this, Nancy, employers every time we survey them, we've been doing this for the past 20 years, back to the soft skills work that was done a long time ago, are naming the kind of things that are important to have in the workplace: teamwork, problem solving, uh, time management, um, you know, uh, uh, initiative, flexibility, communication skills, all of these things that they're naming that are important. Those are really being built into STEM. Um, I mean, STEM programs, in order to get young people to think differently in science and math and engineering, are really more about pro using a project-based approach, using problem solving, having young people work in teams, having them do more inquiry kind of thinking. Um, so those are, as we're naming the skills, if we don't just say, keep saying social emotional learning, but we start to yeah. talk specifically about the kinds of skills and competencies and the kind of attitudes and values that you want to have sort of around those, those are the things that are being reinforced. And certainly when we get to career and technical education, uh, we're also beginning to name skills and competencies um, that are relevant for the workforce. So I think in general, this focus on social emotional learning, um, building on the idea, it's building on two ideas, it's building on one idea that these skills are actually malleable and you can train for them. If kids mm -hmm. have a chance to practice them um, and see them modeled, they will learn them. Um, and we can be explicit about that learning. And the second thing is, which you started with at the beginning of the, the hour, is that learning is social and emotional. And if we don't pay attention to the context in which learning is happening, you're undermining whatever content you're trying to deliver because we, like, people don't feel that sense of safety and belonging that allow them to fully engage. So that's really one uh, piece that's there. Another question that, that has come in, um, and I'm not seeing the tension, but I want to read the question as is, many programs provide out of school and summer programs. And when it comes to the summer, the National Summer Learning Association and others tell us to think about how programming can prevent summer learning loss and focus on academics. How do we reconcile these seemingly competing priorities? So let's mm. talk until we get to the end of the time, if no other questions are coming in, about how we help folks both in school and after school not see these as competing priorities. Yeah. So I, about the summer. Yeah. yeah, I think that's, you know, and I think that that's one of 
the issues, right? Is that people do see them as competing priorities, you know, but I think that, um, you know, not to put too much emphasis on one study, but as a meta-analysis, the Gerlach and Weisberg study incorporates multiple studies, right? And, and what they showed is that, in fact, focusing on SEL can increase academic skills. So, so it's not an either or, right? Um, and that, again, I think when we broaden the focus of what we want youth to get at, right? So, you know, and maybe this is just my my personal opinion, but I but I don't think it is, right? That to me, the goal of even formal education, right, of, of during the school day education um, is, is about producing well-rounded citizens, right, which is more than academic knowledge. And so to me, thinking about how our schools and after-school programs and summer programs working together to give young people the full set of skills they need to, you know, live, to, to be thriving and healthy human participants in our society, right, which is a lot of SEL and um, or 21st century skills, however you want to name them, right? Um, I see somebody just just noted, could this be the portrait of a graduate, right, as, as a coordinating? I, I think that that is sort of what I'm kind of suggesting, right, um, that that connects these. And the more we see these connections um, and, and note that, they're, that these are all important goals, um, I think the more we can resolve that, that tension. Yeah, and agree with all of those points. Um, um, I'll have Ian add to uh, the list of things, links um, that we send out, a link back to a conversation, a thought leader conversation that I had with uh, John Hughes in January um, of 2018 um, on the power of summer learning. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll give you that link. Um, but, but just briefly to this point, because I think this competing priorities thing is one that we really need to aggressively tackle. Um, what, uh, there's, a, there's an entire uh, set of work that was done around summer learning, just, just really sort of assessing and improving the overall quality um, of summer programs from a youth development perspective, um, using the Weikert Center's tool, the Youth Program Quality Assessment Tool, and really building in rapid strategies to help program uh, providers really improve the quality of those programs from the context perspective to make sure that young people were engaged so that learning could happen. Uh, mm -hmm. In Seattle, um, uh, they, they took it a step further, um, and John Hughes, who was the director of summer learning, uh, their focus on elementary schools, um, partnered with some of the major youth organizations like Boys and Girls Club to create full-day uh, summer programs that had academics focused on math and reading for elementary school kids who explicitly were behind in those areas, plus your traditional summer uh, youth development activities. Um, what they did uh, in the first year was to assess the quality of those full day programs from the context of youth development quality. Is this an environment in which young people are engaged in learning? Is the context for learning happening? Um, they trained the teachers who were teaching the content, the academic content, in the math and the reading curricula, but they assessed the quality of these 50 plus uh, uh, classrooms uh, that were in the elementary schools for the summer. They just assessed the quality to see what the variation was. And what they found was that you did have variation, even though these, these were folks coming from organizations, youth organizations that had been trained in quality, but also including teachers that just were naturally coming in. The quality of the overall setting the environment for those youth organizations um, really had a huge impact on their content learning. So looking at the quality of the programs, the high quality programs, programs that were in the top third um, of the scoring, so these were just programs where the teachers and the staff had come together and were just naturally, probably because of some training and temperament, were naturally creating those kind of high quality learning environments where young people were engaged you had math and reading retention at four or five times the rate of what happened in the other programs. So you managed to stave off summer learning loss. You saw gains in the, the, the programs that were not in the high quality category, but they were nowhere near as significant as the gains that you saw when you actually paid attention to 
creating the context for learning and having staff in there who were delivering the content. And this was academic content. You also saw when they came back the second year to look at this that you got, as you mentioned from Durlock and Weisberg, you've got skill growth in the social emotional areas as well. So the more we can help folks understand that when we create environments in which engagement happens, in which learning happens, and as you said, Nancy, in which we're paying attention to young people's social skills, their emotional skills, their cognitive skills, and whatever the content is that they're exploring um, or needing, needing to master or improve. And when all that is happening in an integrated way, it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, and yeah. so we need to see these as not competing priorities, but just this is the priority. How do we integrate yeah. this stuff um, together? Um, okay. I don't know if you've got other examples in that. And with, with uh, five no. minutes before the end, did you have some I was, slides? Did you want to show us your yeah, slides? Yeah, well, I was going to actually say, um, if, if you want to throw up the second slide, I was just going to um, note. So the first slide is just reproducing a table that was in the chapter, which is about um, sort of findings from the research. And what I was going to highlight is findings from the research supporting what you're saying, Karen, which is that although there's sort of a you know, mixed findings on, on the impact of after school in SEL, um, you know, consistently the qu quality matters, right? And so we do know that. We know that, that it's not just attendance. It's not just having a program. Um, certainly we know unsupervised time is bad, um, but we also know that quality matters for promoting positive outcomes. Right. Um, and then the second slide, which is, is sort of, I think, also just thinking about the complexity of um, the context of after school programs. This is taken from um, the book that I wrote with Bart Hirsch and David Dubois um, about youth development organizations is, you know, thinking about the fact that young people as individuals come into these settings and that the settings are made up of a combination of, a, of sort of a culture of a particular center, youth staff relationships and specific activities and programs. And, you know, not one center is going to be able to serve all youth well, that there's an interaction between the individual sort of characteristics of a young person and the center, um, the, the sort of three bubbles of organizational character, of, of characteristics of the center um, that together sort of promote youth outcomes and really thinking about the quality of what's happening there um, and how that interacts with different youth, I think, is really important and key. Um, and not expecting a single program to work for all kids, right? Um, that there is a fit. If we think about the sort of foundational work on, you know, in person environment fit, there are different fits for different different people in different settings, and that goes for youth and after school programs. Um, and so I think that's that's important to think about. But as as you were saying, really honing in on understanding and being able to improve the quality of of what's happening um, in those domains, I think is really key. I think that's terrific. Your your fit comment um, is is one that as we've been having conversations. Um, resonates well because it's it's one of the things that um, when we come back to this conversation around equity, um, we have a challenge on both fronts. Uh, it really is important for, for, for young people to fit into uh, the setting where they're going to be spending time. And we know that because parents that actually have the resources will either go into a school and, and, and change teachers if they don't see a good fit between the teacher and their kids. They may change schools in their district. They may even pick up and move to a different district um, in order to get their young people into the kind of school day setting that they want. And then if you're in a community that is rich with these after school resources, you've also got a lot of opportunity then to shop around for fit. You, you exactly. have parents or then young people themselves. So that diversity, not just is something available, but is something available that's high quality and fits is a really, really important point. Um, yeah. Your last slide is probably where we should end with a minute left, which is yeah. where should we go from here? So, Nancy, where should we go from here? Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I think for one, we've talked a lot about quality, and I think focusing on um, evaluation for improvement, like Dale, Dale Blythe talks about moving, moving from approve, approve model of evaluation to an improve model, right? I think is really important, thinking about how do we understand um, understanding what's happening in the practices so we can improve them. I've noticed that a number of people did ask about um, measuring outcomes 
for SEL. I know, Karen, you mentioned some of the, um, the resources for that, and somebody else noted a resource on the chat Zoom about uh, one of the SEL measurement guides. I'll also let you know that the National Mentoring Resource Center website, um, it's more specific towards mentoring, but it has a measurement resources to a measurement toolkit under its resources, which can be broadly applied to after school programs as well. And you can look at, at different, it's, they've reviewed different outcome measures for different domains. Um, of different social outcomes, behavioral outcomes, emotional outcomes. And so you can actually find information about tools and find information about their validity and reliability on there that's useful. Um, and I think the focus on staff is key. I really do think we need to focus on staff. That was brought up in, in some of the questions and comments. Um, and I think it's really important because the relationships with staff, um, you know, are some in some ways, they are, they're, they're the ones who are going to make what happens happen, right, in their interactions with young people. So. Well, a focus on staff and a focus on adults is a wonderful way to end the conversation. The hour has gone quickly. I'm going to turn it back to Ian for instructions. Well, I want to start out by saying thank you very much to both of you for a very rich and engaging conversation, and thank you also to everyone who uh, offered up your perspectives and questions throughout today's conversation, either via the chat or via the very healthy Twitter dialogue that's going on right now. Also wanted to announce that we are lucky to have two thought leader sessions scheduled for this month. The next one will be in just about or just under three weeks on Wednesday, October 24th. We'll have a session on choosing the right path for su successful scale up, a thought leader conversation with Sam Larson and James Deering. So again, that's Wednesday, October 24th, and the registration and sign up is available on our website. So uh, thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Ian, and thanks again, Nancy, for a great conversation. Thank you. I've really enjoyed the opportunity.